Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist at Nutrient Ag Solutions. I want to thank you for watching this special video for Farm Credit Illinois covering the late winter and early spring and even a summer glimpse uh, in our forecast outlook here. So I'm going to start off with this map right here, which shows you the accumulated snowfall departure from normal through February 6th. Now, when you're watching this map, what I want you to understand is that these colors represent more snow than normal by inches, and these would be in deficit through this time of year, through February 6th. And what we see across the state of Illinois, departures from normal aren't too significant, a little bit more than normal in western and southwestern Illinois. But if you get over to the eastern and northern parts and even down at south, uh, we do see a bit of a deficit. I want your attention drawn to the headwaters of the Mississippi and the Missouri River. Because if we start to think about what we're going to be dealing with this spring, it's important to know how much excess water is in the soil. Some parts of the, of the Dakotas have actually seen over 150 percent of a normal full winter's worth of snow. And remember, we get not only here in Illinois some the potential for big snows in February and again in March, but the north central plains can have big blizzards all the way through April. So when we look back over the last 30 days, and again, this leads up to early February, we can see that much of the state of Illinois had a pretty wet go of it through January and early February. Uh, several locations here reporting between 150 and 300 percent of normal on precipitation. So we know that we're saturated. While California is looking very dry, so are parts of the southeast looking quite dry as well. But we need to put this in context of how much water is in that soil because when we think about what might be coming down the pipeline for spring well understanding that parts of the north central plains here have an excess of two to six inches of water in the soil beneath the snow beneath the frozen top soil sitting there that's all that all has to drain out and where is it drain well it comes down through parts of the missouri river it comes down through the mississippi it comes over into the ohio and it all meets here and heads on south to uh, through mississippi so we already are kind of uh, set up here to have a pretty well soggy start to our spring but remember if we warm up early and we can start to get this water flowing this could actually lead us to to a great water profile as we move into our planting time period but that's going to require a relatively drier spring. We're going to address that in just a few moments. Honestly, the map that you see right here is one I want you just to keep in the back of your mind and keep checking in with me on how it changes because it will be critical to our spring planting time period. In terms of drought, well, of course, the Corn Belt has none, but we've been watching drought in the four corner states and drought in Texas very carefully. And all that I want to say about it is this. If we're still talking about that drought and it's early May, that we need to start be uh, start worrying. And that's because drought in these regions, if they move north or if it moves east at all throughout the late winter and early spring and starts to invade parts of Oklahoma and Kansas, that's going to be critical for potentially setting up our summer pattern. And what I'm worried about is maybe the jet stream wanting to bend around it into a larger ridge doing something like that. So we need to watch this area very carefully for drought development. But I'll tell you something, don't worry about it until we get into, you know, late April and early May to see if it's expanded too much, okay? From there, we have certainly spent almost every day since, uh, gosh, what, two days before Christmas with well above average temperatures. When you look at this map, this looks at the last 45 days of, of temperature anomaly, so differences to normal. We've tucked a lot of cold air away in Alaska and in Greenland, and as a result, really relaxed the pattern across the lower 48 and across parts of the Canadian prairies. When we see, see the state of Illinois, we've spent much of that last time period, 45 days here, about 8 to 10 degrees above average average. And as a consequence, look at what's going on in the Great Lakes. Lake Erie, which is the shallowest of the Great Lakes, it's this one right here, uh, normally is almost completely ice covered. So far this year, only 1%, a little bit less than 1% is ice covered. So we need to be watching what's happening in Alaska because it's going to be the main setup for our pattern moving forward. Well, what are we looking at? Over the next 10 days, this is how the jet stream is behaving. There's a sizable ridge of higher atmospheric pressure sitting off the west coast. And it's forcing the jet stream to build into a ridge that comes here into Alaska, dives down through the mountains, and then curves into a deep trough before racing on off, actually all the way to England. Splitting around the, the bottom side of this ridge here is the subtropical jet stream, which meets it in Texas. So what that means is over the next 10 days, we have got to watch very carefully in through this corridor where these two pieces of the jet stream kind of come back together to give us, well, an 
exit strategy out of this trough that could be producing several low pressure systems that roll out of Texas and go straight to Maine. This is a pattern that's going to pile up the snow in the Intermountain West. That will also be a critical piece for our spring and early summer. And it's going to keep us on the wetter side of things here in the state of Illinois with repeated low pressure systems. So here it is. This is the setup I want you to all to be watching. It's coming very quickly off of Japan, splitting here into a little high over low pattern, coming back together in this area and racing on off toward the north and east. If this pattern continues, well, what I can tell you is this is almost a carbon copy of the flow pattern of the atmosphere from last spring. So what do we end up getting? Well, we end up getting this, just repeated low pressure systems coming through the United States. And as they come through the midsection of the country, they keep us wetter than normal right into this area. Well, what about snow? What we, we're looking at for snow here. This is a map that shows the probability of getting at least six inches of snow through um, well, February 22nd. We can see that because the jet stream is doing this, so let's get over there in black color here. Here we go, doing this and then pulling on off to the north. You know, we're, we're drawing in quite a bit of warm air out ahead of each one of these systems. And the storm track is, is going to be favored coming out of Colorado and heading on north like this. So bigger snowfall amounts are going to be north of the state primarily in parts of Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and of course in the Northeast and out in the Intermountain West. So at this point, getting us through the middle of the month, while we could still see some snow in the state of Illinois, getting those big snowfall events, right now the models are suggesting there's a lower probability. But remember, forecasting big snow events is a day-by-day -day activity, so we'll keep a close eye on it and keep you updated, all right? Let's come back to that pattern and what it does to our temperatures. I'm looking now out to about uh, February... Uh, 12th through the 17th. That's when the ridge starts to push into Alaska and the flow ends up doing something like that. We have a big protective ridge over Cuba. The trough is in the west and we live right on the battleground where the warm air is coming from this direction, the cold air coming from that direction, and the two meet here. And that's why our active storm track is set up where it is. But overall, when we put together the next 10 days, we will average temperatures that will either be right on their normals or just a little bit warmer than normal. So what's this pattern doing? Well, when we just take a look at it and blend together all of the different things that can affect the flow of the jet stream for us, we notice that through the next 10, even 15 days, so this is getting through much of the month of February, we continue to want to put a large ridge in the flow of the jet stream here in the Gulf of Alaska. Now, at the same time that that's going on, we are resisting ridging over Greenland. If we were gonna turn brutally cold in the state of Illinois, as we move through the month of February, we need to build a big ridge into Alaska and a big ridge into Greenland. And right now, Greenland's not really playing along. You see, the North Atlantic has been in this phase. It's called the positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, where there's been a trough over Greenland. And what does that mean? That means any cold air that we keep getting in the United States wants to peel off and go down into the western United States. While this ridge here tends to keep the eastern third of the country with, uh, well, above normal temperatures. This pattern is almost, again, a carbon copy of spring 2019, which means we need to see if this pattern is going to change anytime soon. Certainly, the polar vortex isn't really playing cards with us this year. What you're looking at down in that series of maps on the bottom, we saw a little bit of a disruption in the polar vortex right here in the first week of the month of February. But the polar vortex goes right back over to its strong circular circulation. And as a result, it's keeping all the cold air tucked away inside of that region, not letting it come out and stay over much of North America. So translation, if the Arctic Oscillation is positive like it's forecast here, and not negative, which would be down here, it's going to be very difficult for us in the state of Illinois to get really, really sustained cold air anytime soon. What do we need? Well, our coldest Februarys feature a lot of heat in Alaska and over Greenland. That pushes the cold air down right through the Canadian prairies and sets up over us. And as you just saw, the atmosphere is not doing that. It's putting ridging here, but a trough in that area, protecting the east with a larger ridge of higher atmospheric pressure. So it appears as though we're going to be getting through much of the month of February without seeing any major long duration sustained cold weather. And remember this, we are gathering daylight hours pretty quickly and meteorological spring begins on March. So as I just take you all the way out to the third week of February, you see exactly what I was talking about. The ridges in here, 
the flow is doing something like that. And therefore, it appears that through much of the month of February, we are going to resist getting brutally cold air in place. Yeah, shots of cold air, normal winter weather, but no chance at really, right now at least, of getting, you know, 7 to 10 days of much below average temperature and a lot of snow. One thing I want to watch very carefully are the global winds. We actually measure how fast the global winds are compared to the rotation of the Earth, and they were peaking for much of the month of January. They've since began to drop off, and for our spring forecast, we need them to continue to drop off and come way down here in negative territory as we move forward. And that's because right now we don't have an El Nino or La Nina signal to help guide what's going on with our uh, spring forecast. In fact, we've been jokingly calling this La Nada all winter long. It's warmer on this side and a little bit cooler over here, but no strong signal coming out of our El Nino region. So we just look from mid-February through mid-March, putting all those pieces together, it seems as though the, the jet stream is really blocked up around a, a ridge of higher atmospheric pressure here, forcing it to do this. And as a consequence, this sets up a very active pattern in this section of the country. Our temperatures are split almost exactly on the same way. Two centers, one with cold air in it, one with warm air in it, and right down the middle here is the battleground, which is why you see the forecast for precipitation looking the way it does. Okay, before I give you the long range for spring and, uh, spring and summer, I want to give you a quick update on South America. Over the next 10 days, this gets us out to about uh, the middle of the month of February here. That box you see there sits over Mato Grosso. And if Mato Grosso continues to be wet, it's going to delay the soybean harvest. Things in Argentina, well, they just got a decent rain, and there's some more must-have rains coming through to help them finish the crop. But if there's any sort of a delay in the harvest here in Mato Grosso of harvesting first crop soybeans, that could really put some pressure on the safrina crops, a big one which is corn. Right now, Brazil's price on corn is very supportive from the going after huge acres, and we know that domestic supply is low, and they've, uh, you know, their export demand is high. So we anticipate Brazil to have a huge soybean crop, maybe 123 million metric ton, and they're going to go aggressively after planting a lot of corn. So we must keep a close eye on this because this could be part of any sort of a spring rally that we have in markets. But finishing this up, let's take a look at spring. These seven models that are a part of the multi-model ensemble that we run here in the United States and Canada are continuing to paint part of the Ohio Valley wet. Why? Look at how dry things are in California. Split flow, I've drawn this for you several times. This model has really been honing in on this. But I want to make sure that we all understand something. These long, you know, three-month-long forecasts, how accurate are they historically? About 40%. So when you look at this, what I'm trying to share with you here is that the models are really hanging on to persistence in the forecast. They're staying with uh, this idea that the pattern we're in now isn't going to change. I'm telling you, watch out for change in March, because if that pattern slows down or blocks up, this entire forecast here for March, April, and May is thrown out the window. All right. If we look at the best model in the world, the, the European model, it has for the last three months continued to paint this side of North America with a wet bias. We don't see a strong temperature bias at this point. That's the map over there on the right for March, April, and May. But it wants to, as the other models do, keep the jet stream pattern really active over this area. What I'm asking you to do now is just remember that current soil moisture anomalies are high, and the pattern, if it continues, could give us another wet spring. Now, while that is not good news for everyone listening to this video, what I want you to remember, though, is that a lot can change between now and by the time we want to start planting. Think about May 2018. A cold and wet April 2018 gave way to some of the best planting conditions we've ever had. So just remember, those changes can still happen. I want to finish up with just letting you uh, think about one thing I'm, I might be concerned about for this upcoming summer. And that one thing is taking a look here at the uh, temperatures stretching from south of Hawaii into the Gulf of Alaska. If we see that region cooling off, there's a historical correlation between that cooling off Alaska and Greenland and letting the heat build into the midsection of the country. Well, right now, longer range forecast models are trying to cool this part of the ocean off, but keeping much of the North Pacific warm. We need to keep an eye right here. If we notice that over the next four months, that that region cools off significantly. That is just one precursor, just one, that summer might be quite warm. But overall, if you look at the longer term statistics, and this is where we'll wrap this one up, April to October, 
Over the last 71 years, for the primary corn belt and for the state of Illinois, the longer term trend is for us to have a wetter growing season to the tune of about five and a half inches. So we would have to buck this longer term trend, but we've done it in the past. That's 2012. So what I'm asking you to do is keep an eye on it with me. Now that we know the pattern through the remainder of February, we need to be watching for something to shift in the Pacific as we work our way into March. All right, we'll wrap it up right there. I hope everyone has a great spring, and I hope uh, to look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thank you.